Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and welcome to Saturn. Today we're going to be talking about the recent announcement that we've just discovered 20 more miniature moons around this beautiful planet, making this now the official record holder for the most moons in the solar system. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. So it was actually only a matter of time before we found more moons around these large, extremely, exceptionally uh, gigantic planets known as cast giants. We've actually known about uh, various hidden moons for a very long time, and we've even discovered a few more around Jupiter back in 2017. There was a video I made back then explaining exactly what these moons were and uh, how they were created and uh, why we were more likely to find a lot more relatively soon. Well, it took only two years, but this time it was not around Jupiter. It was around its neighbor Saturn. And although there are still, I guess, 79 known moons around Jupiter, Saturn now has 82. And what's really um, interesting here is that it was such a huge amount of new moons discovered by a single study. They were literally able to very accurately identify and analyze 20 specific objects around the orbit of Saturn, each of these roughly around 5 kilometers or so in size. Although some of them could actually be a little bit larger than 5 kilometers because we're not entirely certain of their current size. And as you can see from this image here, the moons are now officially divided into three family groups based on their orbits around Saturn. So the closest moons uh, that orbit in the same direction as other moons, the so-called prograded um, orbit, are uh, known as the Inuit group. And the Inuit group is basically named so, so that we can give these moons uh, names of Inuit uh, gods, basically gods of Inuit mythology. And the Inuit people that you see right here have one of the richest mythologies ever. There's a lot of gods there, so there's definitely going to be a lot of uh, really cool names we can pick. Then the second group, the Norse group, that's the largest group discovered. And all of these will be named after various Norse gods. So probably not Thor and not Freya, but some other less known gods because all of the other names have already been taken. And lastly, the smallest group is the Gaelic group, and that's the one that will be named after the Gaelic gods. Now, why do we have these three groups of various mythologies? Well, that's because pretty much as soon as these moons were announced, and as soon, essentially as soon as they were discovered, the Carnegie University um, asked for help naming them. And I'm posting the link for this contest in the description below, but basically here you have until December 6th of 2019 to uh, propose various names based on these mythologies and your name might get picked. Now, um, if you don't know anything about those mythologies, well, that's probably a good chance for you to kind of catch up when you're reading and to discover either Inuit, Norse or um, Gaelic mythological creature or entity or god that you would like to propose for a name for these uh, various moons. But there are actually quite a lot of really interesting discoveries coming from the study. For one, as I mentioned, the orbit of the closest of these moons takes about two years. Just to give you a comparison to my favorite moon of Saturn, which is this right here, Titan. Um, this is already pretty far away from Saturn. You can kind of see Saturn right there in the back. And a single year here, or a single orbit around Saturn, takes about 16 days. But these farther moons have a much, much farther distance. An orbit here takes two years. And just to help you visualize how far away this is, let's recreate this very briefly in Universe Inbox. So here, just for fun, I decided to name one of these moons, um, and it's actually from Inuit mythology, and the name is... Oh my god, I'm gonna totally butcher this. Eirdlirvirisisong. Eirdlirvirisisong. Ah, that's pretty good. I think that's pretty spot on. By the way, Sedna, that's another um, one of the dwarf planets we have on the outskirts, is also named after Inuit gods. But anyway, so Irudlir Virisisong, according to uh, Inuit mythology, is the demon cousin of the moon. Sometimes it comes out into the night skies to dance and make people laugh. But if anyone is nearby, the people must restrain themselves, or the demon clown will dry them and eat their intestines. Right, so looks like I picked a good name. But anyway, so this really complex name is just an example of one of the names we could potentially pick for the uh, naming of these various moons. And here, if you look at the orbit, it is really, really far away from Saturn itself. So there is Saturn, there is Titan, you can kind of see it in the distance, and the moon I just placed 
is on the outskirts, somewhere right here, and the distance here is about one tenth of a distance of Earth to the Sun. So this is actually pretty far away. Um, in reality, I think it's a little bit less than that, but this is kind of where some of these moons are located. So they are really, really far away from Saturn itself. But for the most part, they probably all look very similar to what you see on the screen here. Today, we believe, um, based on the discovery, is that there are actually three much larger bodies that were probably responsible for creating these moons. Uh, essentially, what happened here was probably a very large collision between a proto-moon or basically a much larger asteroid that got captured by Saturn. Just based on what we're seeing here, the scientists were able to figure out how all of this very likely happened. They were probably all made from a rock slightly larger than the one you just saw. This is probably, I don't know, about um, six or so kilometers in radius, possibly a little bit more. And um, this was probably a, uh, an asteroid or a very early protoplanet that um, never really got to become a planet. And this particular rock was very likely traveling through the early solar system the so-called protoplanetary disk where all of the planets were made and somewhere out there somewhere in one of these gaps was saturn and as it traveled through this gap it basically got um, attracted to saturn to its gravity but at the same time the dust in between these rings started to slow down this asteroid and at some point it essentially got captured by saturn itself so in other words it kind of looked something like this Normally, a rock or an asteroid passing next to Saturn would most likely just experience um, basically a slingshot maneuver. It would do something like this. It would have its orbit bent a little bit, but would not really get captured by Saturn. For this to happen, something needs to slow it down. In other words, for uh, this asteroid to become a moon of Saturn, as it passes close to Saturn, or as it passes really at any distance away from Saturn, it needs to have its velocity decreased. This is literally how uh, we were able to get into orbit of Saturn with the Cassini mission. And um, this is pretty much how all of these moons were able to acquire these orbits as well. But how can it slow down? Well, one way of slowing down is if it starts hitting some kind of a dust field. In other words, if it flies through um, the protoplanetary disk, of the early solar system, kind of like what you see here. So if this rock now moves through the orbit of Saturn and then starts hitting all of this dust that is still there in orbit around Saturn and also um, basically everywhere in the solar system, all of this dust will eventually slow this rock down to the point where it gets captured by Saturn. And this is kind of how we think all of these irregular moons of Saturn and Jupiter came to be. In other words, even though there are many moons that were created during the formation of Saturn and were even made from the same material as Saturn itself, such as for example Titan, we think Titan may have been made along with Saturn, there are still a lot of other moons that were definitely captured afterwards, specifically right after the creation of Saturn, but before the um, protoplanetary dust dissipated and before the solar system became the same way as it is today. And based on what we're seeing here, we think that this happened at least three times. So there were at least three separate captures and very likely a lot more that we haven't discovered yet. And then when these larger pieces got sort of captured by Saturn and started orbiting around it, eventually they received a collision from something. Or maybe they just fell apart for some other reason. But this is literally how we believe all of these parts were formed. This is why we believe they all have very similar orbits, but at the same time, uh, they're not in a single piece. They must have collided with something else and got destroyed into tiny pieces, which suggests that it's not just maybe 20 or so moons here. It's probably thousands, if not millions. It's just most of them are very, very small to detect. And so once we're able to use a more powerful telescope, something that can resolve moons up to about one kilometer in size, will very likely end up with thousands if not millions of various moons of both Saturn and Jupiter. Because that's kind of what we think is here. It's not just 79 or 82 moons, it's probably a lot more. We might need to even reclassify these because we're going to run out of names pretty quickly. Remember how a few years ago Pluto lost its status from being a planet to being a dwarf planet? Well, expect that to happen with moons pretty soon. We're probably going to have a new concept known as maybe dwarf moons or uh, tiny moons or moon moons. Actually, that already exists. But it's very likely that as soon as we start discovering more than we can handle, we're going to have to completely change our understanding of what's really happening here. 
But for now, we don't have thousands or millions, we just have 82. And all these were discovered using the Japanese Subaru telescope that's actually in Hawaii and that's capable of detecting and resolving these very, very small objects really far away. But what's really interesting about this discovery is that it wasn't actually made recently. We had this data for a very long time. We've actually um, had these observations back in 2004 until 2007. But it was the use of a new algorithm that was able to discover these moons and that was able to analyze this data that allowed us to discover uh, something that was always there, we just didn't really see it before. So the combination of new telescopes and new data analysis will definitely increase our chances of finding new objects out there in the solar system. But I guess until new moons are found or until we discover more interesting things, check out the naming contest, maybe your uh, choice will be picked, but also make sure that it's something that meets the criteria. It has to be one of those specific gods because that's normally how we name objects in the um, solar system. And anyway, until we discover more about these moons or I guess until we find more unusual moons out there, that's really it. Check out some of these studies uh, I mentioned in the description below and also come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye. Irduliviri song. Irduliviri song. Irduliviri. God, this is a difficult name. Huh, maybe I should just pick something else. No, I can do it. Irduliviri song.